What I'd like to do is provide an overview of some pest management concepts that I think every employee, manager, and owner in the food industry needs to be familiar with as part of that food safety culture that Dion and the other panelists were just discussing. Next. That's far ahead of where I'm supposed to be. Angela, that's about four slides too far up. Let's, Is it? There we go. Um, okay. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today are the risks that pests pose to food safety. I'm back on the original slide. Is this slide one, Dan? No, I want to be on the next slide, one that has topics to cover. There we go. Uh, Sorry about that. Okay, we're, we're still off a of slide, but that's okay. Um, no, go one more, advance one more. No, go back one more. So this is back one more, yes? Yeah, that's it. Topics to cover is where I am, yeah. Okay, sorry okay. about that. I'll talk about the risk of food safety. That's okay. Um, how HACCP and FISMA address that. Talk about the three types of pest management, exclusion, sanitation, and pesticides. Then talk about some of the common pests in management. Next. So if all pests did was eat our food, that would be annoying and cut into profit, sure. But that's really not the big issue. The biggest issue is that they spread disease. Um, you can see here a number of pests carry a number of pathogens that they can transmit to food. Next. And it's not just diseases. You may recall a number of years ago, there was a, a large recall of uh, infant formula. Next. And that was due to this insect right here, the warehouse beetle. You see the, the yellowish larva at the top. On the right, you're seeing a microscopic photograph of the hair on the larva's body. The formula and these barbed hairs would get lodged in the gastrointestinal tract and cause a lot of discomfort. Next. So, this is why HACCP and FISMA talk about pest management as part of prerequisite programs and preventive controls. Next. And it's not just hypothetical. Um, we go to the next slide earlier. Uh, Department of Ag and Markets has shown that rodent defiled food and insect infested food are among the top five reasons for food seizures in the state. And the reason this is happening, FDA finds year after year that lack of effective pest exclusion tops the violations they find in their food uh, inspections. Next. So one, one mantra we have in the pest management industry is exclusion equals pest prevention. If you keep pests out of the facility, then you won't have a problem. It sounds easy, but it's not. Next. And so again, um, HACCP and FISMA address exclusion, saying you must exclude pests from a facility. Next. And obviously this starts on the outside with the grounds. FISMA requires you keep equipment, waste, and vegetation away from the building, provide adequate drainage around the building, and even exclude pests coming from bordering properties. Next. So in this picture, you see all these things coming together. Um, you notice they're doing a good job of keeping vegetation away from a building. Why do you want to do that? Well, think like a pest. Let's take a mouse. A mouse is a prey species. Everything out there eats mouse eats mice. I call them nature's chicken McNuggets. Every predator eats mice. They don't like to be out in the open. So if you have a bunch of vegetation like shrubbery right up against the building or pallets stacked up against the building, oh, not because it's a grocery store or a food plant, they don't know that yet. They're just going to see a place to hide. And once they're there, they start tooling around and then they find a way inside the building. Now you have a problem. So if you don't make it to inviting to them in the first place, they won't show up. You see the drainage here, uh, where the two guys on the left are walking. Uh, water's gonna come off the road, so this drainage which is channeling water away from the facility because wet conditions, whether on the ground or against the facility, provide breeding grounds for pests. 
And the big thing you notice in this picture is what's off in the distance. There's new construction on. Okay, and whether that, what used to be there was a field or a woodlot or old buildings, it's a pretty good bet that rodents were there. And now you're having all this disruption, they're looking for a new home. So what this facility needs to do is step up their rodent monitoring along the far wall of this building closest to that uh, disruption to see if rodents are coming in, if so, to, to catch them. Next, please. And you'll see along the outside of the building, are you advancing to the next slide? This is, there we this go. Is, um, this is the slide I want, yes. Mm -hmm. So as the, um, the siding comes down, you see it's, cut, it's capped at the bottom. They're doing a good job of vegetation control. You want about 18 to 24 inch vegetation free barrier around the building. Next. And another area to look at is the receiving. Um, for two reasons. One, if you're gonna receive something into a facility, you have to open doors. When you open doors, you've created openings for pests. The other thing is, how are your suppliers doing as far as their pest management goes? Are they being as diligent as you? Um, so in the receiving area, that's a place where pests can come in. So you see the blue arrows pointing to a rodent um, monitoring station. Cockroaches can also be a problem. They come in on cardboard. Cockroaches can hide in the corrugations of cardboard and they can eat the glue. So you could get even a supply, something that's not food, maybe it's just paper goods coming in, they can be hiding in the cardboard. Next, please. So here we see an outside of a facility that's not so well maintained. You see the siding has got gaps, it's coming loose. Pests could easily get up and under that siding. You also see the vegetation is encroaching it. Next, please. So as we walked around this facility, we weren't surprised to see what we see in the next picture here. There we are, rodent activity. It's just too inviting. Next. All right, am I seeing the slide? There we go, okay. It might just be my internet connection is a little slow, I'm sorry. It must be a delay, yeah, um, it must be. Yeah, okay, so I'll just go talking. When I say next, I assume you advance the slide. Okay, so what we see is where utility chases come out of a building, pipes, those areas need to be sealed or else pests can get in. Next. And one of the things that we run into a lot is people use spray foam. The spray foam you can get is not rodent proof. They'll chew right through that stuff. You, know, you, need to use, you need to use concrete or metal escutcheons around pipes to seal up those openings. Next. And the same is true for door frames. Um, the door suites you're going to buy in a hardware store are not rodent proof. They might keep the drafts out, but rodents can gnaw through them. Next. And loading docks are especially a problem, especially if you have uh, plates that can be raised or lowered. It's very hard to get a very good seal. Again, there are companies out there that can help you with this. You notice a little bit of light coming through. It only takes a quarter inch opening for a mouse to get into a facility and only a half inch for a rat to get in. The very small openings are all they need. Next, please. And don't just look down. Uh, rodents are excellent climbers. You get an uneven surface here, like a brick wall. They can climb right up to the top of the building in no time. Here we have a mouse that's eyeing a, uh, a wasp nest trying to get some of the grubs for lunch. Next. So if you're having a pest management professional coming to your uh, building to inspect it for concerns, be sure to bring them up on the roof. This is off of Google Maps. This is the top of a state-of-the-art dairy facility here in New York State. Look at all those structures up there. You got HVAC units, vents, probably some plumbing and electric. All those places where there's penetration through the roof to bring the services down into the building, those are potential access points for pests. I've already shown you rodents. American roaches will fly up to the roof. And no roof is perfectly flat. If you look at a flat roof after rain, you're always gonna see puddles here and there. These roofs will collect pollen, leaves, uh, 
maple seeds, things like that. So when you get moisture up there, you're going to get an organic soup forming that pests like fungus gnats and springtails can breed in and then get into the facility. So always include the roof in your inspection. Next. Plantation is another leg. I'll talk about it more with specific pests. But again, FISMA addresses it, requires you to prevent rubbish and food waste from becoming an attractant harborage or breeding place for pests. So when you take that kind of garbage out of the facility, you're doing two things. One, you're preventing possible pest populations. And two, if you do have a pest situation in the building, there are likely a lot of them in that food waste. So next slide. We refer to sanitation as being equal to pest control. It's very important. And again, I'll talk about that more as the specific pests. Next, please. So that'll bring us now to the third leg of pest management, which is pesticides. Um, HACCP and FISMA obviously both allow the use of pesticides in food facilities, but only if you properly segregate them so you don't allow the food itself or food contact services to be contaminated with chemicals. How do we do that? What's the best way of making sure we use them properly? Next slide. The key is to use pesticides according to label directions. I'm always surprised at how many people don't know that it's actually against federal and state law to use a pesticide in any manner other than what's described on the label. It's right there. The first sentence in the directions for you is telling you that. What this means is you can only use a pesticide where says you can, how you can, how much you can. If it says to apply one per thousand square feet, you can't apply three ounces. In New York, you can't apply one. You have to apply two according to label directions. Next, please. So one of the first things you need to do is make sure the pesticide can be used where you want to use it. For example, here it's saying for use in food processing and handling establishments. A can of Raid that's meant for homeowner use and talks about use in the home in a residential kitchen, that can't be used in a food plant or a food facility because the label doesn't say it can be. So what's it mean when it says a food handling establishment? Next, please. What that means is any area other than a residential setting in which food is held, processed, prepared, and or served. So that means food processing plants, dairy plants, grain mills, distribution centers, bars, grocery stores, restaurants, the food aisle and the drugstore, these are all count as food handling establishments. Next. So then the question is, okay, I can use it in food handling establishment. Can I use it anywhere in the establishment? Maybe yes, maybe no. Again, you have to look at the label. Here's talking about use in food areas. What does that mean? Next. Again, in regulation, food areas are defined specifically as particular parts of a food handling establishment and as opposed to non-food areas. And so a label will tell you where and how you can use it in a food area, where and how you can use it in a non-food area. And one thing that trips people up often, it's pretty obvious what's a food and non-food area. But if you look under non-food areas, you see four drains to sewers. If you have a drain leading to a sewer, that's a non-food area, even if the drain opens out into a production area, okay? The drain itself is non-food, and that matters when you're looking at the label to see what pesticides you can use. Next, please. And if I can use it in that food area, oh, I'm sorry, yes, one thing I forgot to mention. Another source of confusion is about who can apply pesticides in food areas. In New York State, if you're applying a pesticide in a food area, you need to be certified in category 7F, food processing, or be working under the supervision of someone who is. In the non-food areas, that's 7A, structural and rodent. People think because the name of the category in regulations is food processing, it doesn't apply to restaurants, bars, things like that, but it does. Any of these commercial food areas to apply pesticides, you do need certification in 7F, food processing. Next. Okay, so I can use it in a food area. The label is going to tell me to be careful about that. Avoid contaminating food and food product, food uh, contact services. That means that the person you're hiring, the pest control, needs to know what we mean by food. Next, please. And it sounds easy, and most people will say, well, that's what we eat and drink. But the third bullet here, it's also any article 
used as a component of food. For example, ingredients. So a lot of people won't think of whey powder as food, yet it's a food ingredient used to make food. So that does count as food from a in a food standpoint, uh, pesticide use standpoint. So it's important your applicators understand that. Okay, so how can I use it in the food area? The label is gonna show you how. In this case, it says only apply product into cracks, crevices, and other inaccessible areas. What does that mean? Next slide. Again, these kinds of terms are defined in regulation and people need to be aware of it. For a crack and crevice treatment, if you have a crack on a production floor, there might be flies living in that, you know, that crack. It doesn't mean you spray the floor and some of the pesticide gets into the crack. It means you actually place the pesticide only into the crack, not onto the floor. A spot treatment sounds simple. I might all be say is on the labels, make a spot treatment. What that means is that um, you have to limit it to contact with workers or food contact services or food. And if you have more than one spot application in the same room, it can't be, the spots can't be contiguous. Next, please. So looking back at this label, I can't make a spot application in a food area with this product because it says only apply into cracks, crevices, and other inaccessible areas. In fact, the word only isn't even needed because the label says apply into cracks and crevices, but doesn't say make a spot application, doesn't make a space spray. Then I can't make those other applications. I can only do what the label says I can do. Next, please. And a common concern is with space sprays, which is what it sounds like, pesticide being applied into the whole room. It's like an area spray. Labels will often say that food processing services and utensils need to be covered prior to application or washed out. So if you're a high control technician to make this application, they're gonna want you to cover those services first. They're not gonna be happy if you say, oh, well, don't worry, we'll wash them later. Because if you fail to do that and something bad happens, it's actually the applicator that gets in trouble for not following label directions, okay? So you need to communicate with your applicators all the time. Next, please. Um, I mentioned before the site has to be on the label. Here in New York State, the pest also has to be mentioned on the label for the site in which you tend to apply it. So here are all the pests you can apply this pesticide for in a food area. You notice I've highlighted roach all flies because they're food pests. Stored product insects like grain beetles and Indian meal moth are not on the label, so you could not use this product to control these pests. Whereas you could use it to control roaches and small flies. Next. So reading the label is and understanding is extremely important and we do find pesticide misuse where people fail to do that. And the common one I just wanna point out so people are aware of it is no pest strips containing dichlorbos, which is a volatile organic compound, which means it dissipates out of this pest strip into the air. It's an organophosphate insecticide, which means it disrupts nerve function of people as well as insects. And every label of these pest strips says, don't use in food areas of establishment. Next. That we, con we constantly see it being used in those areas. Next. Even on the right side of this other slide, you'll see it. Um, yeah, one more slide. You see bagels? Mm -hmm. Yes. There's a, there we are. The pest strip is right next, right next to open food. Now, because the pesticide is volatilizing off that pest strip, it's in the air, it's gonna end up on that food. Putting that pest strip right there is no different than spraying the food directly. Why has this happened? Well, people aren't reading labels. Maybe it's a breakdown of command, an employee who's not really responsible for pest management. You know, it's this fruit flies, goes to the hardware store next door and buys this pest strip, hangs it up. Customers come in the building, they see them, they're not terribly concerned because maybe they're using it at home themselves in a way they're not supposed to. Um, but it is illegal. It could cause uh, food contamination issues and human health concerns. So if you see this, please point it out and stop the practice. Next slide. Okay, so let's now, I think we're switching gears now to individual pests. 
I mentioned rodents before I can get into small openings. Next, please. And that's because they're constantly gnawing. Not only can they squeeze into those places, but they can make their own openings if there aren't any to begin with. They gnaw to wear down their front incisors, which are constantly growing. They eat just about anything. I've shown you they're excellent climbers. And again, they're prey species. So they like dark, undisturbed areas. If you have a rodent situation in a building, the place where they're likely nesting are things like drop ceilings that you never look into. Um, behind the kick plates under gondolas in a grocery store, the kick plate hasn't been removed recently. Um, think about your own home situation. If you've ever discovered a mouse nest when cleaning out your garage, where do you find them? It's not on your workbench, it's not right under your car. It's in that corner of the garage where you've packed stuff away you haven't looked at in a couple of years, right? Same thing in food facilities. Next, please. So the key is not to allow them those hiding places. Use Dunadrax to keep items off the floor. Store items away from walls so you can easily look around them and monitor things. Maintain aisles. Avoid clutter. They love clutter. Things that never get moved. And obviously inspect for and clean up spills. Next. What I really want to talk to you about with rodents is monitoring. You see a couple of monitoring stations here next to a door. Next, please. For years, the standard for placing traps for rodents was every 20 to 40 feet along the inside walls of a building and outside along the exterior every 25 to 75 feet. And if an auditor came by and found out you didn't have traps every 20 to 40 feet, you'd get dinged. Okay, you'd get marked off on your audit. There's a couple problems with this. One is rodents aren't good at math. Second, um, you can space traps every 20 to 40 feet, but if you're not putting them where rodents might be, if you're putting them out open, it's never going to go. You may never catch anything. You think you don't have a problem, but you maybe do. So next slide, please. So this method is now out the window and it's been replaced by trap placement based on risk. That requires a facility survey and looking at activity history. Where are rodents likely to be? Where are you finding them? And auditors are going to look for that. They're going to ask you now why you're placing your traps where you do. The other issue and the other revolution in dealing with traps is inspecting them. Uh, traditionally, a tech would come into a building and open up every one of those traps and see what's in them. Next. So one company was checking the efficiency of this, and looking at all their logs, what they found over time after opening 62,000 traps, only 152 contained rodents. So that might show you're doing a good job of, you know, keeping rodents out. But think about the time it takes to bend over and open, check on, close, reset, 2,000 traps. How much time does that take? Next slide, please. If you look at this uh, facility, Again, maps, uh, facility in New York State. The top picture, at the top you see the food uh, processing facility. Bottom right is the distribution center. Those two buildings combined cover a half a million square feet. It would take a technician about an hour and a half to check all the traps in those buildings. And that might be all they do when they come to your facility is check traps, say, okay, we, I checked them all, I found a mouse here, here's a report and they leave. Now over a month, that's six hours of time checking those traps. And based on the data I just showed you, five hours, 50 minutes running empty traps. Okay, that's not an efficient use of time. Next slide. But now we have a solution for that. Electronic rodent monitoring devices. A lot of companies make these, um, but they all work on basically the same principle. Next slide, please. You have your standard rodent trap. They work with all the basic traps you're familiar with. There's a sensor that's now attached to the trap that detects when a rodent is caught. It sends a signal to a Wi-Fi device in the facility. Oh, that's, good. that's okay, you can be there. It sends it directly to the technician's tablet, phone, whatever. Next slide, please. And that's instantaneous in real time. And it also the software makes a permanent record that this trap in this location 
caught a rodent at 1125 on Thursday morning, August or September 24th, while you were paying attention to some conference. So now when the tech comes to the building, all those green circles you're seeing, those are traps that don't have anything in them. Now they can spend their hour and a half looking at that one trap, what they catch? Mouse, rat, juvenile, male, female, more than one. And they spend that hour and a half to figure out why did we catch something there? At 11.25 in the morning that day, was there a shipment coming in? If so, from whom? And they spend their time diagnosing the problem. So this service will cost a bit more because of the technology, but you're getting better service out of it. You're getting diagnostics instead of the, the yes, we caught a mouse. Next, please. So we've talked about you know, different methods for managing rodents. The last one on the list here is rodenticides. Next slide, please. They're a very useful tool in managing uh, rodents and food facilities. There's an important caveat on the label saying don't place baits where there's a possibility of contaminating food or food contact services. And that makes perfect sense. And you're not gonna do that. And the technician's not gonna do that. But a rodent might pick up a bait and carry it off. Next slide, please. And so they might, the rodent actually leave the bait someplace you don't want it to be. And worse yet, it might leave and die in a wall. Now that bait is there unused, it becomes actually a food source for stored product insects. And the dead rodent in the wall gives off odors, which then attracts flies. And the last issue is, next slide, a rodent that, um, has consumed a sublethal amount of toxic bait, might start acting in ways it doesn't usually act, like coming out into the open in the middle of business hours. And as you can imagine, this could be a social media nightmare for this grocery store. So I'm not saying rodenticides are bad to use, but they just have to use properly and discuss with your technician uh, when they're being used. Next, please. We can talk about roaches, uh, everyone's favorite insect. In food facilities, uh, the German and American roaches are the most common. American is the really big ones, inch and a half, two inches long, that really give you a, a startle when you see them. Next slide. Roaches eat just about anything. I mentioned the glue and cardboard. Uh, they'll eat anything, including shed insect skins and their own droppings. And while that sounds gross, we actually use that to our advantage, which I'll mention in a few minutes. Like any pest, they prefer warm, dark, protected air in the earth and water. The more they're hunting around, the more they're exposed, and they don't like that. Next, please. In fact, they spend a lot of time in harborage. Uh, this is a German cockroach female trailing an, an egg sac behind her. She's going to carry that with her until the eggs are about ready to hatch. She's a good mom, and she's going to want to place them in harborage where there is food and water and protection. So that means she's going to spend almost 90% of her time hiding. And when the young hatch, as you know, insects molt from one stage to the next. During the molting process, they're very susceptible to prey. So they're gonna be hiding during that process as well. And what it means is with any roach population, only about 15% of the population is gonna be actively foraging at any given time. So if you see a roach and you stop by and kill it, well, that's great, you killed one roach. But what about the other six or so you don't know where they are next? So to manage roaches, sanitation is big. Waste management, of course. Vacuuming is good if you know where they're hiding. If you can open up that area and vacuum it out, it's a quick way of reducing populations. And you want to eliminate breeding and harborage sites. Um, next slide. And this goes along with proper floor cleaning. So this picture is actually of flower beetles on the ground. You see little specks of flower around. An insect doesn't need much food uh, because they're small. You can see this equipment leg has gaps between it and the floor. So if you're mopping the floor, you got a wet mop, you get the slurry of food stuff in the mop, you slap the mop up against that equipment leg, you're actually forcing this wet food under the equipment leg right where the pests are hiding. You're delivering food to them. So to prevent this problem, you need to seal that harborage so that insects can't be hiding. You're not delivering food to them. Next, please. Hey, um, pesticides for cockroaches, crack and crevice sprays, or dust if there's an electric motor involved, uh, work well. And baits, next slide. Baits are very effective against cockroaches, but only if you team them up with really good sanitation. The way a bait works is the cockroach has to 
consume the toxic bait. If there's a lot of other food sources around in competition with that bait, they may never find it. Or if they do, they might not eat much of it. So you need really good sanitation. And baits are slow acting. If they were fast acting, a roach would eat the bait and die. Great, you killed the roach. But again, what about those six others? By being slow acting, what happens is the roach consumes the bait, goes back into its hard bridge, where all the other roach buddies are hanging out, and the roach defecates. The other roaches see those dropping pellets and think, ooh, snack time. And they actually eat the droppings. As gross as that sounds, what they're doing now is they're eating some bait. That's how the bait spreads to the roach population and you get broader kill, even if all the roaches didn't find the bait themselves. Next, please. Um, American cockroach control is very similar. Uh, the, diff the big difference with American cockroaches is where they are. They really like drains and steam tunnels where they get hot and warm. So you need to do a lot more focusing on drains with American cockroaches. Next slide. Uh, if you're gonna use a drain cleaner, make sure it's a foaming drain cleaner so it coats the entire interior diameter of the drain. Same thing with insecticides. You can actually use foaming insecticides in drains so it leaves a residual coating of insecticide on all surfaces of the drain. Not just the bottom where water might go down the drain, but all surfaces. You catch any roaches in there. Next, please. I think we're on to small flies. Um, they're a big problem in a lot of facilities. Next slide. We'll start with the fruit fly. A lot of us are familiar, that, familiar with those in our home if we left bananas in the on the shelf too long. They're attracted to decomposing organic matter that gives off uh, the smell of vinegar. So in food facilities, they're a big problem uh, in bars. They like beer mats. Tell you that, um, under vending machines, cracks and crevices where food waste accumulates, and dirty mop heads. I've already talked about how the, the mop makes that food slurry. If your custodial staff puts the mop away and leaves the mop head on the floor, it's not going to dry out, and that actually becomes a breeding site for small flies. So you need to let them know they need to hang the mops so the mop head air dries. Next, please. Cleaning floors, always a good thing, but again, all this is going into drains. So you have to be able to clean the drain. Next slide. Be careful about where you're placing it. But this drain is not clean very often, which means you're going to have fly problems. Next. And this extends to outside the facility. Uh, dumpsters are removed frequently. Back the other to acknowledge there's going to be spillage around the dumpster. So you have to clean that up as well. Next, please. So then we have we were disturbed practice. I'm really not seeing the next slide here. So you're, give me a nod. Is that stored product insects? Yeah, we have that. Yeah. You're, oh, four powerful. flies. That's so you, right. Yeah, you may have a little internet issue going on, but we, we have it up there now. Did we lose you, Dan? Yeah, Joel, I think we lost. Oh, there he is. Is he back? Yeah, he's back. Okay. Sorry about that. I'll get this back on. That's okay. So, um, forward flies, a lot of places like uh, food flies will be also like the uh, feed lines from dishwashers and soil under broken sewage pipes. So, next, please. Drain flies, I think they're kind of cute, uh, but you'll see them in, in rooms a lot because they like to breed in the organic scum in the drains. Next. So taking care of flies, a lot of the same stuff. Oh, I'm sorry, house fly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very quickly. The gross thing about house flies is the way they feed. Um, they have sponging mouth parts. And um, that means they can only drink food. But why are they landing on your uh, hamburger bun outside, it's because they see it's food, but they have to liquefy it first. So they're gonna land on it, and they're gonna regurgitate their stomach concepts, contents on your hamburger bun, so they can then slurp it up. And if you think about what house flies feed on, 
you really don't want them regurgitating their, their stomach contents onto your food. Uh, next slide. So managing flies, a lot of the typical things is sanitation, keep doors closed. You can use air curtains that forces air away from the door. Again, insect and air uh, curtain, I mean, I'm sorry, light monitors are very good, light traps. You wanna make sure that they are using non shatter because what you don't want is um, broken glass in your facility. You also want to use glue board so you can see what the problem is with the pest. You can you know, identify what the pest is. And um, you want to avoid the use of um, electric heaters because what happens there is they, the insect actually explodes a lot of times. You get little insect bits floating on the facility with all the pathogens they carry. I remember being at a local uh, ice cream stand a few years ago with my wife. They had two windows for ordering your, ordering your treats and they had installed a bug zapper above one of them. Thank you. They installed the bug zapper above one of them and I sort of tugged on my wife's arm and said, let's go to the other window because those aren't the kind of sprinkles I want my ice cream cone. So you really avoid bug zappers around. Next. And I'm not seeing slides, so I'm guessing on the slide employee awareness. Is that correct? Um, so we were just on the managing flies, monitoring the the shatterproof bulbs, glue board. Yep, we talked about those. And then so we I didn't forget to say next. I'm sorry. You can go next to where the that's employee okay. awareness. Okay, so going back to the topic we were, that was being discussed previously about the food safety culture. I'm gonna have to skip this, have time for those guys. If we can just get down to food um, employee awareness, please. It's a few slides ahead. But we're skipping all of the, um, all of the, the storage pests, that's okay? I think I lost them. Okay, I'm really sorry about this. And I'm out in the sticks. I don't have a great internet connection. Um, but if we can get to employee and awareness, you can view that slide. Sorry. Yeah. And if you cut your video, you might save yourself some bandwidth. Yeah, I'm doing that right now. Thank you. So, so we're on the employee awareness slide now. I talked about, right, I can see that. Okay. So I talked about that half million square foot facility before. Collectively, employees will see every square inch of that facility on a regular basis. So you want them to be aware of pests. You train them in OSHA, COVID, obviously, in retail outlets, they know about the credit card requirement. You need to make them aware of pests. Okay, next slide. This is not an approved use of a rodent trap, okay? Yeah, it's hot in the kitchen, or they want to step out and take smoke and security reasons we just have an, a knob on the outside, but this is not good. We see this a lot and you just have to let people know it's not good. Next, you keep your food production equipment, food serving equipment clean. So why would you allow a toaster oven in a break room to look like this for a couple of weeks? Okay, pest problems that develop in the break rooms can lead to pest problems in your food areas. Next, please. Likewise, um, cleaning out the recyclable bins. It's great the employees put them in there. A lot of times they don't rinse them properly and you can have wet food in there that again uh, produces breeding grounds for pests. And I see we're at 1141. I'm, I'm sorry for my connection, so let's go next slide. Very briefly, I wanna mention we do uh, run an annual food processing pest bin workshop uh, named after Ron Gar, a lot of people uh, may know. He's recently retired. These are some of the recent topics and speakers we've had. Uh, we hold it typically in February in Rochester. This coming year, we're gonna be doing it virtually. I'm not sure how many people we can have because it's gonna be kind of, um, because of the how we have to monitor the attendees for DEC credit. So I'm not sure how many people we can actually have on hand. Um, but one thing we're thinking of doing is holding a second workshop 
probably during the summer in the southeast portion of the state, maybe in the Westchester area. So next slide, please. Dan, Would take you your time. We have a break like at, that? Dan, it, let me inter interrupt yes. uh, a second. We are taking a break at noon. So you have, a, don't, don't stress, take your time. It's not a problem. Oh, I haven't. I thought it was eleven forty-five. Okay. It, well, right. you're done um, at eleven forty-five, but we were taking a break after that. So I'm saying, if you had something else you wanted to share, you want to go over a few of those slides. I have two questions for you from the from the participants. So, if you want me to back up to the okay. story, certainly do that. No, that's okay. Let's start with the questions first. We have time. I'll go back to all. Just okay. want to let people Perfect. know if they're interested in this other workshop. It's a good idea. Um contact me, my email is there at the end. Um, we're looking for more, you know, we get a lot of people from the pest management industry and actual food processing facilities. I'd love to get more people involved from retail. You see, we've had people from Target and Rite Aid, uh, restaurants, grocery stores. It's a great opportunity for, if you work in a grocery store situation, talk about the issues you have with pest management, because you're audience the people you might be dealing with. It's a great way of educating uh, pest management professionals about the specific issues you have. So yeah, uh, let's take a couple of questions first, if we could. I'd be okay, so I have a question from one of read them the, off. do you want me to read it too? Yeah, how, from Corey Skier, how do you yeah. think reduction of food sources from restaurants and food establishment closures in New York City will affect the rodent population? Good question. That's an interesting question. And actually at our, um, at our workshop in February, I have Joe Brilli from Bear, who's gonna be talking about how all these closures have been us. I'm not the expert on that, but in February, we'll have an expert talking about that. What I do know is they, the roads had to go looking for food. Yeah. Um, they started appearing in places that no one had seen them before. They were actually running down city streets looking for food. Um, one problem is if a restaurant or facility closed because of COVID and they didn't properly, uh, they didn't clear out the facility first and left food in there, left garbage, then they're kind of gonna come back. They will come back to a big rodent problem. But if they were good about cleaning stuff out, now those rodents are looking for a new food source and they were moving. Um, I've heard reports of rodents showing up in neighborhoods, you know, suburbs where they just weren't a problem before, or suddenly they're getting into people's houses because they're out looking for food. Okay, uh, the next question. What recommendation would you provide for cleaning methods in a dry food production area to best prevent pests? For years and years, many sanitation chemical suppliers have been promoting wet cleaning using hose and squeegee for wash, rinse, sanitize, and I'm not convinced this is the best way. In fact, when approaching some of the leading providers, they are unable to advise on viable alternatives. I'm still of the opinion that drier methods are better. What are your thoughts on this? Thank you. Okay, I, I <laughs> will say- question. No, I, it's a very important question, and I will say it's kind of outside my expertise. Um, a lot of the stuff I've talked about is stuff I've learned from these people here. Um, the wet Sounds like a drier problem, situation, as you're mentioning, right? I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that's okay. Um, Using wet cleaning products, again, where I see that would be a particular problem is if you have a lot of these nooks and crannies that pests can hide in. If you've got everything well sealed, so there's no place for that water to go other than the floor and the drain, then I really don't see much of a problem with it as long as you're cleaning the drains well. Um, yeah, I, if you're just gonna try to vacuum it dry, I, I'm honestly, I wouldn't be the person to talk to about that. Uh, one name you see up here on the slide is um, Dr. Spragans with Rockwell Labs in Wisconsin. So if you look at Rockwell Labs, they're really good at that. Um, Insects Limited is another company 
uh, based in Indiana that does a lot with stored product pests. You see them on here, they've, they've talked before. They might be able to give you some really good tips on what to do. So uh, I would actually point you to those, those two folks more so than me. Okay, great. And then we have a question about how can someone learn more about the um, pest management workshop? They, apparently this person used to receive the invitation every year, but they have not. So we can always put it on the website, but how else could they sign up for something possibly? Yeah, we, we typically advertise it in November. Unfortunately, uh, right now our website is gonna be switching. So I don't really have the URL for it. Um, if you can put my email up there, the next slide. Right yep, now I'm still we'll seeing that the food processing workshop. Correct. So if people are looking at my email, send me an email, tell me you're interested in a workshop mm -hmm. and I'll get back to you. I'll, I'll put you on a list. What we typically do, because we hold it in Rochester is we advertise to businesses in DEC region seven, eight, and nine, mainly, you know, Syracuse and West. Um, if we hold one in the Southeast, we'll, we'll advertise, you know, down there as well. But yeah, right now I don't have a URL set up for it, but typically we will, we will advertise on our website. Um, yeah, the Institute for Food Safety or DAM, you know, Ag and Marcus will advertise as well, that'd be great. I, I think I do usually notify them that we're doing it. Um, that would help as well. Again, in February, because it's going to be online and we have to monitor attendees, I'm not sure how many attendees we can handle. Right. I'm still working on that. Yeah. Um, so we might have an upper limit for that one. But usually when we're live, we can have as many people as possible. And I have to admit, they, they are really good workshops. You look at those people I had up there, um, we get some really good speakers to come to our workshops. So I actually have a few questions myself, but unfortunately we are running out of sure. time. So I will send you um, my questions via email and I will throw them out there just so people know. I know we run into, as a regulatory agency uh, representative, I run into many people that are trying to keep their facility in an organic ma manner, which mm -hmm. would be a struggle to me. So I was just curious about if you find that as effective as actually utilizing any kind of pesticides. So I don't know if we have time, but is that a quick, do you That's think- That's probably not a quick question effective? because it's, it's gonna depend on, you know, your, your entire pest management strategy. Right, um, so it's a whole. It, it's the whole thing, yeah. Got it. And I, I just wanna apologize for the bad connection here. I, I am working remotely. Cornell wants people off campus if they can be so uh, I live out in the sticks. My internet connection is not the best. So I apologize. No um, apologies. Only missed a couple of slides. No, no, no. No apologies needed whatsoever. We we appreciate okay. your expertise. I learned really something extremely cool about that electronic system that shows you where these rodents are and then how to focus in that area. So that was really, really enlightening to me. And I, I'm sure I can speak for the group here, but we do appreciate your expertise on this topic. So I, I really appreciate your time. And I know I know this whole world with the internet is not a fun situation. And telling someone next for 100 mm -hmm. slides is no fun either. I get it. So I apologize yeah. for that. But we're all in this game together. So this is the way we're ha having to operate now. But thank you okay, so much. You. And it, every You're participant, welcome. Thank you for having me. feel free to send Dan um, an email about any of your additional questions.